These Ukrainian long-range UAVs are something that Russia is going to struggle to completely defend against. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're once again talking about the war in Ukraine and I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Justin Bronk, Senior Research Fellow for Air Power and Technology in the Military Sciences Team at the Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI. Uh, Justin, always appreciate your time. Welcome back to Frontline. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start with, with the news we've had uh, in recent days of, of the drone attack on the Zaporizhia power plant. Russia has claimed Ukraine is behind the attack. Ukraine has denied that. From your understanding, what do you believe happened here? So from what I've seen, there's uh, claimed wreckage of a relatively small um, multi-copter. Um, there seems to be a, a, a sort of utility quadcopter or multi-copter type um, of, of drone um, burnt out. Now, it's interesting that the you know the Russians are claiming that the Ukrainians uh, were behind uh, this attack on presumably vehicles or, or, or other assets that Russia is known to store at Zaporizhia, uh, uses this as a military dump because the Russians know that the Ukrainians are not going to shell a nuclear power plant in their own country. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a, 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 a if it is a, a multi-copter, uh, these systems have a really quite short range. I mean, you know, a few, maybe 10 kilometers at most, particularly with a payload. Uh, and so Ukrainian forces would have to be very close to the nuclear power plant in order to actually have, have got that that UAV across. Uh, and from what I can see of the frontline positions, I don't see how they would have done that. Um, you know, special forces potentially are able to operate sometimes behind enemy lines. But uh, every time you, you conduct an operation um, from a, a special forces team, you're taking a huge risk of that, that team being exposed and, and potentially destroyed. So to expose a, a special forces team operating near Zaporizhia for one small copter um, to presumably drop a grenade or, or something on uh, you know, a few vehicles seems a very odd modus operandi for what at this point are extremely combat experienced forces uh, and very successful forces in terms of attacks on you know, Russian uh, air bases, for example, deep inside Russia in some cases. So yeah, I think the Russian story doesn't add up at all, but also important to, to note that, you know, if, if indeed this was, you know, some sort of provocation, um, you know, attack to, to raise the temperature on, on politically on Ukraine by claiming that they used explosive weapons near a nuclear power plant, the, the size of grenades, which, which these sort of quadcopter type, well, multi-copter type UAVs can carry, uh, would do nothing to uh, either a building or let alone a kind of reactor containment vessel or, or anything. Um, mm. So the danger to the nuclear plant from something this size would be pretty much zero. Uh, it's just that there's always obviously sensitivity with any use of explosive weaponry near these things. So, yeah. So if not Ukraine, I mean, what, what would you say is the most plausible explanation? Could, could this have been a deliberate false flag operation by Russia? I mean, it's possible that it's a false flag operation. Uh, it certainly would seem more likely than the Ukrainians getting something that small, that close, uh, especially now that the use of uh, waterborne forces across the, the, the reservoir is, is much more difficult because of the destruction of the Kokovka Dam. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, a false flag is, is perhaps more likely. But at the same time, it seems a slightly odd one, given, as I said, there's, there's not a huge... Uh, there's no way that this could pose a particular risk to the plant, as far as I can see. Uh, and it's also, therefore, uh, a slightly strange one for Russia to draw attention to, uh, hoping that it will put more pressure on, on Ukraine politically. Uh, but, you know, at that point, one would be speculating into how the Russians are thinking. So probably not something I should try. And do. Yeah, and it is interesting because for... For, for some time now, you've, you've had accusations being traded between Russia and Ukraine, accusing each other of targeting the plant how serious is the risk of a, of a nuclear accident there would you say so in terms of um attacks on the on the plant and indeed nuclear facilities more generally uh the class of weaponry that you would need to be using for there to be a significant danger of a, a sort of containment breach would be pretty high so ballistic missiles potentially and so one of the areas of concern particularly early on in the war was uh, that, that Russia might use ballistic missiles against Ukrainian nuclear facilities. 
um, those have a sufficiently high velocity as they come in and a sufficiently large warhead that that could potentially cause uh, significant damage to, to an actual reactor. Um, but, you know, nuclear plants are built to very, very high structural standards. Um, they have to be able to withstand uh, an airliner crashing into them. Um, it's one of the design specs uh, without a uh, danger of release of radioactive material. And so, you know, you would have to use something pretty hefty. The bigger concern, I think, is that because Russia has um, you know, been using the plant to store military equipment for a long time. Obviously, if you store large amounts of ammunition, for example, around a nuclear plant, that could potentially be a real issue. Um, but also, primarily, they've been restricting the ability of the Ukrainian um, workforce to do their job and restricting the access uh, from the, the International Atomic Energy um, Establishment to come in and basically check that the plant is operating safely. Because uh, if you don't maintain a nuclear plant, plant properly, uh, you potentially build up risks over time, such as, for example, the, the cooling systems, um, the various uh, steam exchange systems. If they're not maintained properly, um, you could potentially get into a point where you have a risk of uh, the breakdown of some of those cooling systems. And at that point, there could be a real problem if the reactors are still uh, either operating or in hot shutdown. Um, this is something which uh, a number of my colleagues at Rusi have done some really good work on, particularly Daria Dolzakova. So, I, you know, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, I, I would highly recommend looking up some of the risks on on uh, work on risks of of nuclear um, release or, or, or you know issues with the power plants, um, particularly of course uh, in, in in Zaporizhia. Let's come on to one of the big stories from last week, and a Ukrainian drone hit, of course, a building in the Tatarstan region of Russia. It's the deepest attack into Russian territory since the start of the war, being more than 800 miles from the Ukraine-Russia border. In fact, we've actually got some footage of the strike and also of the aftermath. If you could just uh, take a look at this, Justin, and just, just talk us through what we're seeing here, that'd be much appreciated. On the face of it, what we're seeing here is is fairly... Uh, Simple. It's a an adapted ultralight aircraft. Um, I believe it's a, a twenty two Foxbat. Um, essentially, a cheap and cheerful um, private propeller plane, uh, which has been adapted for use as a one way attack uh, UAV. Uh, so much as the uh, sort of purpose designed Iranian Shahed one three sixes are a sort of standard component of Russia's air campaign against Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has been developing a, a range of uh, one-way attack UAVs um, from quite small systems uh, to things that clearly <laughs> that are adapted from ultralight aircraft, which for one-way attack UAVs are, are on the sort of larger, larger end of things. The, the basic relationship between range and therefore reach against targets at, at distance uh, and size is that the larger something is, the more fuel it can carry and the more payload in terms of warhead uh, you can pack in for a given um, level of performance, if that makes sense. You're always going to be trading off um, weight that you can carry and fuel um, with performance. So if you want something to go uh, hundreds of kilometers at quite high speeds, it's going to have to be jet powered and that will give you a, um, a fuel burn that means you're going to end up with something about the size of a cruise missile um, at minimum. If you want something that is much smaller that will go the same distance, you'll typically have to accept a much slower speed, um, <clears throat> which means that you're dealing with a lot less drag and you're having to put in a lot less power for any given kind of time period. Uh, that means you'll have a lot slower transit, of course, um, but that is why uh, most of these kind of one-way attack systems that are designed to be relatively cheap and, and used in large numbers are propeller powered slow uh, and therefore can cover significant distance even though some of them are quite small. So the, the Shahed 136 is about 200 kilograms. It's not tiny, but compared to an aircraft, it, it's pretty small. Um, that can go more than a thousand kilometers. Clearly in this case, the Ukrainians have taken a, uh, a, an ultralight airplane, um, which typically you might expect to be able to fly for maybe three, four hours. Um, that would be with an, with an hour of um, fuel margin if you were flying it as a light aeroplane because you have to have a fuel margin. Obviously, for a one-way attack system, that's not a concern. Um, and they've put uh, what looks like a probably 20 to 30 kilogram warhead in there in terms of the, the, the blast, probably closer to 30. Um, in some ways, these systems are, are very simple. 
but in, in the sense that they just need to fly to a given point, probably using GPS uh, or, or GLONASS, the, the Russian equivalent, and then go into the ground at that point. On the other hand, the, the kind of considerations around when they work and, and how they work in, in terms of their effectiveness are really quite complicated because for a start, flying slowly may actually help in some cases to get past older air defense systems because radars uh, use what's called what are called Doppler gates to try and filter out because a radar is sending out um, to, to try and um, detect air threats. A radar is sending out energy uh, and essentially receiving back all of the echoes from that energy bouncing off things. Radars don't want to have to display, uh, well, you, you don't want your radar to have to display, you know, the ground, trees, birds, clouds, uh, depending on the, the frequencies that you're using, uh, they might reflect as well. And so essentially most radars for, for air defense work or, or for fighter aircraft will use Doppler to basically filter out all the returns that don't exhibit a shift over time from something moving at a given speed. So if something's moving either fast towards you or fast away from you, there will be a, a Doppler shift um, evident in, the, in the, the returns. And so most radars will simply drop things. In other words, they won't display, they won't track um, things that sit outside a given speed range. So if it's a if it's an air defense radar, you might uh, have the radar designed to pick up anything between about 100, 100 miles an hour and one and a half thousand, let's say. Um, and if it's a ballistic missile radar, you'd probably go even faster or would go even faster. Um, so if you're dealing with really slow flying things, unless operators know that there is a slow flying threat that they need to potentially be concerned about, the radar may simply filter it out as kind of background clutter uh, and therefore not display. So in some cases, slow aircraft actually are, or slow UAVs are actually more difficult to defend against. Um, it is possible, particularly with modern radar, radars with a lot more digital uh, control over the signal and the processing of it, to have really much wider Doppler gates. And so most Russian systems, in terms of the, the, the most up-to-date stuff, are actually able to track these things, at least most of the time. But even then, you typically still have to be widening the Doppler gates more than you'd like uh, in terms of making sure you've got that coverage. And what that will mean is that there will be a lot more clutter and a lot more kind of junk returns that than operators would like because they're having to, to cover for things that are moving pretty slowly and therefore they're getting a lot of returns from other things in, in, in the, um, the environment. There's also, of course, the case of electronic warfare. So both sides in Ukraine, but particularly Russia, use electronic warfare extensively. Um, the most common being simply the jamming of GPS uh, signals. So if you are flying a UAV uh, and it navigates using GPS, which a lot of commercial UAVs and a lot of the commercial GPS software and, and chips, which are used to adapt um, you know, whatever it might be, UAVs, light aircraft, etc., for these, these military purposes, uh, will simply not function if GPS jamming equipment is being used around them. Um, you can play around with a sort of a mix of an inertial navigation system, which basically measures or tries to measure distance and speed and heading over time. As long as you know where you were when you started, then you can kind of, um, with increasing errors over time, you can navigate uh, with an automatic system. Now that might enable you to get through an area where there's quite a lot of GPS jamming. And then hopefully once you're past the area where GPS is being jammed, as long as the error that's accumulated is not too big, then the system may be able to then pick up a GPS signal again and thereby correct its position. Um, so there are ways to navigate through the EW, um, but it's again a huge constraint on where and, and how ubiquitously these sort of UAVs from the very small up to the rather larger like this can be used. In some ways, striking target in the really deep areas is, is perhaps easier because, you know, this was not one of Russia's key, for example, bases. And so this far inside Russia, it's unlikely there'd be much in the way of air defense systems there. There's a finite number of SAM systems that Russia has and, and operators and capacity, so they can't defend everything. And it's far enough back that the uh, costs of imposing GPS jamming, for example, in that part of Russia uh, were probably assessed as higher than the benefit likely to be gained from any uh, you know, protection because they didn't think it would come under attack. Um, 
so yeah, the, these Ukrainian long-range UAVs are something that Russia is going to struggle to completely defend against because you can't put air defense everywhere, you can't put EW effects everywhere, and certainly not all the time. But at the same time, it's probably important not to overstate how effective these things can be. They impose damage, they impose cost, but they're not going to have strategically decisive effects. You know, if you look at Ukraine itself, Ukraine has taken about eight and a half thousand missile and one-way attack UAV strikes over the last two years. Ukraine is a significantly smaller country than Russia. It was a significantly less resilient in terms of the, the pre-war state um, country than Russia can be. Um, and so, you know, given that Ukraine is still fighting and of course has taken huge damage, but is, is still able to continue the war, we probably shouldn't overstate how much attacks on secondary targets that are not as worth defending in the depth of Russia that cause inconvenience, how much effect that's actually going to have on the overall war. Um, but, you know, we've also seen the Ukrainians use these systems against arguably more important targets. Uh, so, for example, uh, attacks over the last week against a number of U uh, Russian Air Force bases, uh, including their, their one of their primary bases for um, their Sukhoi-34, which is the, the primary attack jet, which reportedly caused some losses. There you would have to use, <clears throat> there would be air defenses. And so rather than having kind of adapted things like this light aircraft attack, where you're just getting a long range thing with a, a clever navigation solution to a distant, not particularly defended target because they can't defend everything. If you're going after things like air bases, you have to use a large number of weapons and rely on essentially suppression of the defenses through saturating their capacity. They can't engage all of them coming in at the same time because either they're coming in from multiple directions or and or uh, there are just enough of them that the SAM systems in, in place run out of ready to fire interceptors and have to reload, which will take a, a while. So uh, there the systems may be cheap but you have to use a really large number of them in order to have the effect uh, because you need to get through defenses. And in that sort of complex attack, you're much more dependent on what the electronic warfare environment is as well and what your seekers are. Because if the Russians know that they're under attack by a really large wave of UAVs, it's really worth their while um, jamming as much of the spectrum as they can for the period that the attack is underway even though it might degrade their own capabilities and potentially expose the location of EW systems. Um, I guess in summary, the, the, more you, the, the, the use of UAVs in general, in, in sort of large scale use of cheap adapted UAV technology, can present a lot of novel problems for militaries. And if militaries don't have any defensive capabilities, they can be hugely uh, damaging. But the more you rely on them as a core part of your military effect, your sort of toolbox, if you like, the more worth the enemy's while it is to develop and to use countermeasures at scale against them. And if the physics problem essentially that you're presenting the enemy with is how do I deal with lots of small UAVs, and that's one of their main problem sets, that's actually not a hugely difficult one to do. So the development of counter UAV technologies is probably going to increase dramatically following well, as the war goes on and following the experiences of the war. If you compare that as a challenge to, for example, ballistic missile defense, where you're trying to hit an incoming thing moving at several thousand miles an hour with an incredibly tight window with angles that are extremely difficult to predict ahead of time, with an, another rocket that physically smashes into it, you know, that as a physics problem is massively more difficult than defending against small UAVs. The reason they're problematic and seen as so difficult by a lot of Western militaries is they're a threat that we haven't really focused enough attention on over the past couple of decades. And so we don't have, for example, ubiquitous short range air defense systems in most of our Western military um, formations. That will change, I suspect. But yeah, it's... Um, it's a problem set we haven't looked at for a while. Justin, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for taking us through that, because I think one of the big questions a lot of people will have had after the attack is, well, hang on a minute, if it was a, a slow moving propeller operated UAV, how did the Russian air defense system not cope better? But you explained that brilliantly. So thank you so much. We probably should just mention the significance of the site that was targeted. You know, you mentioned that actually there have been strikes on maybe more operationally important sites. But this, of course, was was somewhere we believe Shahid drones are being assembled, which obviously tells you something about 
you know, the threat that they pose to Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, the the Russian production of the, uh, as they call it, the Garan uh, tube is really significant now. So most of the Shaheds that are being um, shot down or, or hitting their targets in Ukraine are now Russian manufactured rather than Iranian manufactured. Uh, the quality has gone up significantly in terms of the build quality. Um, the Russians are very good at building missiles, unfortunately. Um, and they're also consistently iterating them at a, at a very rapid pace. <clears throat> so the Iranians are very good at iterating their own weapon systems, uh, but they tend to have a focus on Iranian problem sets rather than the Russian problem sets. And so what you're seeing now is a lot of the uh, production of, of Garan 2 or Shahed is not only at a larger scale, but they're routinely changing the coatings, the, the materials that are being used, the way that the guidance system operates is being updated more frequently. There are more propulsion options. Um, but again, it is always worth stating there's always a trade-off. So for example, people say, well, soon these Shaheds will be able to also target um, moving things and, and they'll become a kind of scourge on the battlefield as well as, as a threat against fixed targets. And they can do that. You can they, they can be equipped with a, with a, essentially a camera system in the nose instead of just a, a, a simple navigate to point and detonate on the ground system and a communications relay to interface with another drone and essentially allow an operator to fly it into moving targets. But if you do that, you're no longer at a system which is costing somewhere between about 40 and $85,000. So you can mass them at large scale. You're now dealing with a system that because of the components used it and the modification is maybe 280, $300,000. Uh, particularly if you want it to then be jet propelled, so it's a bit quicker and it's a bit harder to shoot down, then you're dealing with, yeah, 300, maybe more, uh, $1,000. And so A, you then can't use them in such large scale and B, they're actually then in the price bracket of traditional missiles, which in many ways are more effective uh, because they're a lot more mature and they're just better optimized for a lot of tasks on the battlefield. So there is, I think, a, it's worth being slightly skeptical sometimes about the degree to which these sort of systems can be made truly ubiquitous to sort of replace loads of traditional capabilities. Um, and also to, to emphasize that they're not as novel as, particularly the Shahed, as is often portrayed. It's just that this is the first time we're seeing them used at scale in a war that most people in the West really care about. If you're talking about propeller powered loitering munitions that can travel hundreds of kilometers and strike either fixed targets or go after things like air defenses with, with anti-radiation seekers. The Israelis have been making them since the 1980s. Um, so the, the Harpy and Harrop series of loitering munitions, which uh, the Iranians initially copied for their um, early loitering munitions, which then developed uh, over time into the Shahed. So yeah, e even if there's, almost, there's nothing new under the sun almost, um, it's just that in each case, the context of the threat uh, is different. And what we're seeing now with the factory that was targeted and, and a number of others is Russia really churning out these systems because it gives them a cheap or relatively cheap way to hit fixed targets that don't merit the use of a much more expensive, much larger cruise or ballistic missile. If you like, it's the sort of joint, you know, the JDAM equivalent for them um, because they can't at the moment operate over Ukrainian held territory with fast jets. And while they can and do use large numbers of cruise and ballistic missiles to strike Ukrainian targets all over the country, uh, those cost a you know, million dollars plus uh, and they're, they're large expensive weapons. And so the Shaheds can be used in significant numbers to not only target all of the kind of medium and small targets that, that form part of those target sets, whether it be infrastructure or industry uh, or training grounds, but can also be used to whittle down air defense ammunition and, and give those more expensive missiles a, a better chance of getting through. Um, so it's an important Russian system uh, and it's a big problem for Ukraine, but yeah, it's not perhaps as revolutionary as sometimes made out. And just finally, Justin, symbolically, how humiliating will this strike have been for Russia given how far deep it was into Russian territory. And I mean, it almost reminded me in a way of uh, the case of Matthias Rust, who, who some people may remember, who was this West German teenager who in the 80s um, took an unauthorized flight right into the heart of Moscow, landed in Red Square, led to lots of senior Russian officers being dismissed. I mean, symbolically, how humiliating is this? And, and is that a fair comparison almost in terms of the failures of the Russian air defenses? 
it, it's probably a fair comparison in the sense that <clears throat> it's a similar class of aircraft, albeit a bit smaller, uh, and yeah, able to penetrate deep into Russia and strike things. I think it's probably unlikely to have anything like the same um, political impact in Russia, partly because Moscow has already been hit repeatedly by um, small Iranian, uh, small Ukrainian UAVs, uh, and strikes in Moscow are significantly more politically uh, problematic, I, I guess, for 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 uh, the military and for potentially Putin as well, um, than strikes in in the Russian provinces. I think the the part of the thing to bear in mind is that the political impact on Putin or, or the regime's calculations is really an internal question. People in Russia, in terms of the public opinion, don't really have much much way to express a, a serious uh, discontent, in the sense that the the Russian regime is extremely good at suppressing protest. It's extremely good at suppressing dissent and it's extremely good at controlling the internal narratives in Russia through pretty much total control of the media and a very, very um, extensive internet surveillance and, and you know, firewalling uh, policy. So, you know, while people who saw it in Russia will probably have had some of their faith in, in Russian air defence shaken, most people in Russia are unlikely to be aware of it. And if they are, if they've lost a bit of faith in the in the regime, it, that that shock will last a few days or maybe a week or two, uh, and the news cycle kind of carries on. Uh, and it's probably, as I say, ultimately less less of a visible thing anyway within those caveats than the attacks in Moscow, which again have done almost no 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 damage beyond symbolic damage, but are nonetheless more visible because of where they happened. Professor Justin Bronk, we always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today on Frontline. Pleasure.